I am going to introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Ahmed, who is visiting us from Ethiopia, where she's based uh, with UNFP A, a uh, which you'll say the name is UN uh, United, United Nations, Nations Population Fund. Ignore the F. Okay. <laughs> United Nations Population <laughs> Fund. Yes. And now the, the A is, but that's all right. Just ignore that. Is, <laughs> uh, where she is overseeing the female genital mutilation. Program. program, and we're going to hear about that and all the work you've been doing kind of leading up to that maybe a bit. Yeah. Um, okay. So please take Thank it you. away. Okay. And yeah, well, I think we'll have good time for interaction and yeah. questions. So I told myself not to talk the whole time because we'd have lots of good questions. I hope so. I hope so. And I wait for people to... Join, but yeah, it's so nice to meet you all. Um, I was just reminiscing that um, my relationship with the University of Washington is uh, what 24 years old. I came here in 2000, so I'm really back home. Thanks to Kari facilitating this presentation. So, yeah, my name is Wissal Ahmed, I am an alumni. I did the uh, MPH in epidemiology through the IARTP mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. and a PhD in implementation science from the same university. Um, I'm a medical doctor by training and have always been interested in women's health. Uh, but the last, I don't know, seven or so years focused more on female genital mutilation. Worked for WHO uh, where we worked with the health sector response to address female genital mutilation. And now uh, I am working with the United Nations Population Fund uh, to uh, have really oversight on a multi-sectoral, so it's not just the health sector, but many sectors response addressing FGM in 17 countries. So yeah, so it's a big responsibility, but it's also a very interesting area of work and I'm hoping actually through my presentation to have people interested in this area and, and work with us in strengthening, I think, the evidence component uh, in, in FGM programs. So um, I want to now oh, I should tell so in Layla so they can see her too. Um, yeah. So Let's share the go. screen. Yep, share your screen. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. And this, yeah, okay. okay. I'm going to turn on your video. So, oh, that way folks can, okay, let's see how it works. Okay, so, uh, so my presentation is entitled Do We Have the Right Markers for Interventions and Impact Measurements on? female genital mutilation. And, oh, okay, help you do this answer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, great. So I will just give a brief introduction. Mm -hmm. A global overview on the FGM abandonment progress, uh, something small about what I am currently doing, uh, and uh, try to answer, try to answer why is there progress, what works, what are the measures that we use for interventions and impact, and share some results of an exploratory analysis that we have done recently. So uh, female genital mutilation is a harmful practice as defined by the World Health Organization is a harmful practice which involves partial or total removal of tissue or other injuries to the external female genitalia. It is really a global problem. It affects over 200 million girls and women. Uh, we, there's an estimate of over 8,000 new cases per day. So today, before you sleep, 8,000 new cases occur, have occurred. And it leads to several immediate, short, and long-term health complications that have a whopping health cost of $1.4 billion per year. Um, if you look at your, um, the map 
I, I can't, the cursor doesn't show here on the screen, but on the left, um, sorry, oops. On the, uh, the countries that are mostly affected by FGM are uh, mostly in Africa and what we call the Sudanic belt. It extends from the west to the east coast of Africa. Um, and the different colors just show how high it is, the, what's the prevalence in these areas. The red, just like the traffic is danger, it's over 80%. And the ones that are shaded green are countries that have an FGM prevalence of less than 10%. As you can see, there is a wide variability between countries. And it's, it's not as simple as that. There are also at subnational levels variations. So if you look at the other map on the right, it's not all red, for example, in Egypt or Sudan. There are some patches where it's less concentrated. So uh, yeah, so it's not quite uniform. Uh, there's several origins on about how FGM came to be. Some people talk about it being among the Stone Age people in Equatorial Africa. Some think it has been, it uh, started with the Egyptians. It was found in mummies, what they call the pharaonic circumcision. Uh, some thought of it as, or believe that it's part of uh, slavery trade um, because sort of to ensure virginity, you get higher prices, you know, for girls sold at that price, and others just think that it just arose independently in different communities and it's sort of spread, uh, assimilated, uh, adopted by different people as they moved around. So why is FGM practiced? Uh, it is a social norm and it is done bec because you want to be socially accepted. And also this fear that if I don't do it, maybe people would not accept me. Um, and there are several beliefs around that. Um, some do it because they feel that it ensures, as I said earlier, premarital virginity and the concept around honor, uh, preserving family honor, and also as a marriageability criteria. If you have undergone FGM, you are going to be married. And uh, also related to marital uh, fidelity. Um, others perform it because they believe it's a religious right or a right of passage to womanhood. And uh, it's really to uphold cultural ideals on what they what is thought to be beautiful, feminine, or even for purposes of cleanliness. So many factors on why it is practiced, and it varies amongst different communities. Uh, the main practitioners of FGM are traditional. Uh, but there is an alarming uh, involvement of health workers, uh, what we call FGM medicalization. You can see on the map, uh, there are several countries that are having sort of a, an, a higher, a high involvement of health workers performing this. Um, Guinea is one of them, Nigeria, Sudan and Egypt are the big ones, and so is Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is quite populous, so you could imagine the number of, of girls and or health workers performed, performing that. And health workers are involved because of, they are part of the society, so they are upholding the culture. Uh, but there's also fi financial benefits uh, to it. But it and you know it's not uh, you know it's not unlawful, so they they perform it. They think it's it's a part of harm reduction instead of a traditional practitioner doing it, if a health worker does it, it might be safer, in quotes. So several reasons on, on why health workers are increasingly getting involved. But FGM violates several human rights, um, you know, starting from gender discrimination to life, to health, um, to the rights of the child, because it's performed mostly between the ages of five to nine. So it violates several human rights, and there is, I'd say, good consensus uh, on why it should uh, stop, not continue. So I'd like to just now move on to just give you a global picture of, you know, how, how is the world doing with all these figures that I've shared earlier. Um, FGM is actually becoming less common, and there is growing uh, opposition. Uh, girls uh, living between 15 to 19 years old have um, 
affected by FGM have reduced from half to a third. And uh, there is also the number of girls and women who have who believe that it should end have also doubled. So if you could look on the graph, uh, you could see the, the, the attitudinal change uh, from 2000 to 2020, from 27%, it has uh, doubled. So there is progress. People are changing their attitudes and changing the practice. Uh, is that first bullet? Worldwide? That's globally. globally. That's globally. Of girls. That's globally. Now third? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's, that is progress. Progress, but still, that's a pretty that's, large number. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Really yes. Like true. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, from the countries that practice. Oh, okay. yeah. So there was the 31 countries. Okay. The 31 countries. No, 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 no. The 31 countries that perform, or at least we have data on them, mm -hmm. these are the figures. So there is a reduction um, in that. Uh, again, just another graph to show uh, the intensity. Uh, you know, if you look at the graph, well, the, the map, on, you know, 30 years ago, but that's, that's even more now uh, um, since the publication is 2020. Uh, but uh, you could see that, you know, some places that have been blue, the, the, look at the, just the blue color, it's shrinking, right? The blue is shrinking. If you go from 30 years ago to today, the blue uh, sort of like surface area is, is reducing. So there is reduction, but it's not reducing uh, in, in a, a uniform way or, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's shrinking slowly, actually, to be honest. It's shrinking slowly. And, and we do have what we call the sustainable developmental goals. Mm -hmm. Uh, by 2030, the goal is to have it go to zero. Mm -hmm. um, and if we are to reach that goal, we're supposed to accelerate, in, you know, progress or abandonment by at least 10 times the current rate. So we are really pretty behind. Progress is there, but it's really slow. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's yeah. So... What is this joint program that I'm working in? It's, uh, it's actually the largest global program that addresses FGM. It started in 2008. Uh, it's a joint partnership between UNFPA and UNICEF, and is supported by multiple donors. And several interventions are implemented at global, regional, uh, down to grassroots levels. We focus in um, 17 countries, the yellow, countries. Um, this is the focus. The purple countries, uh, we call them the global influence where we share knowledge and technical support, but we don't necessarily have um, interventions implemented at large scale. Uh, we have several achievements. I am not going to go through all of, the, all of these, but I just wanted to show that it's really, we're really talking about reaching millions of, of people. Uh, whether it's through services, through uh, social media, involving them as change agents. Uh, yeah, so we've done a lot uh, intervention-wise. So, uh, so I've shown you the progress, right? We are progressing, but we're not progressing as fast as we could. Um, so the, it makes people wonder, so what, what works? Like, what works? And whatever that works, we should scale it up so that we can meet that SDG. Uh, there was um, a systematic review of, of literature, a mixture of qualitative and quantitative. There's very little literature, as you all know from my PhD, uh, on, on interventions. And what uh, was found is that um, Community level interventions are, I would say promising, they're called successful, but they, they, they are promising. And uh, legislative interventions on the top, they, they call them promising as long as they are uh, brought together. You know, you can't just put a law, you have to have several interventions in place. Um, service level, um, have shown that training healthcare or health workers uh, to be change agents, um, is suggestive to be successful. So, uh, so you, you there's health workers, there's community level interventions, there is education of girls as potentially a, a good intervention. 
So there are several interventions that have shown some sort of success, but really at small scale, um, not put to scale. Um, uh, this one, I'm just going to skip it, but maybe in the questions. So, so what are the intervention uh, measures? Uh, you've seen that very busy uh, table. Uh, I really want to stand up, but anyway, the, the measures of success are usually outputs, like numbers of people trained, those who've received services, engaged uh, in any of the activities. But it really boils down to what is changes in knowledge, attitudes, intentions, and obviously to practice, right? Prevalence. Um, and what we call the FGM risk uh, incidence. <clears throat> so what we did, um, we tried to see um, what, were, what were the factors that were, asso that were associated or could be associated with attitudes and practices. Um, and we just did a simple uh, correlation, just looking at the factors to see if they determine attitudes. Uh, law, uh, remember there's one about the success in law. Um, you know, education was also one that was found to be a success factor. Um, we, you know, law, there's also the religious part of law. We were also trying to examine that. And we wanted to see if even our program itself, uh, this joint program, could be associated with any of attitudinal or changes or um, in, in the countries that we worked with. Um, so we, you know, first of all, the sample is very little. You're really talking about 31 countries because we're looking at national data. And what we found that sort of indicative like uh, FGM low duration uh, could be associated with um, attitude. But the rest, there was very low uh, correlation between um, these factors and attitudes. And this is, this is DHS data. Uh, so <clears throat> we looked at uh, the FGM prevalence um, we used, okay, we looked at FGM attitudes. So our FGM attitudes determinants of FGM prevalence and whether the FGM load duration has any association with FGM prevalence. Yeah. So very, not very promising, you know, <laughs> not very promising at all. So, uh, okay, so the FGM attitudes, uh, girls and women who do not uh, support FGM was negatively correlated with FGM prevalence, which makes sense, right? Yeah, if I'm not supporting FGM, it means FGM prevalence would go down, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is a bit complicated because um, in surveys, you ask the people the, right now, what is your attitude of F, you know, towards FGM? But the FGM prevalence is really something that happened 15 to 49 years ago. So to me, this doesn't make sense. Like, I mean, it, it does show some association, but it just doesn't add up. And then when we looked at FGM low duration, it's, it's positively correlated. Um, yeah, so again, uh, it makes sense. <laughs> if you have a low, the longer you have it, um, it's supposed to be negative, you, you, you have FGM. But FGM uh, laws are not really enforced in any of the countries. So you have a law issued, and it could continue for 20 years, but it's not effective. It's not being utilized, just a law. Um, so it, it doesn't have any impact. To me, at least from a programmatic point of view, uh, they are not enforced. So I don't know how this association came to be, uh, but it's not, it does not negate the fact that FGM laws are not uh, effective. Um, what would be an example of a FGM law? law country who cannot, is, are they, do they target the medical professionals or is it? It's, it's everybody, general? everybody, everybody. You know, parents can go to jail. Okay. Yeah, whoever made that decision took that girl 
will be put to law, to, to court or whatever. But then there are so many, it's so complicated because um, they are the primary caregivers and we don't have social protection services. So um, it's very hard to report on your parents. That's one. And, um, and even if they do, they, the system does not support it. So most of the time, the, you know, if it is reported to law, um, uh, to legal services, it's never taken to another step. Like they don't put the parents to jail. And <clears throat> yeah, so they don't so a depression is not a measure of how uh, if <clears throat> people who are doing it. They also, they are they pay they they pay money. Right. They but pay money like or put them in jail. jail. Yes, right. Jail. The medical practitioners with the the medical practitioners should be receiving the severest, the most severe. Uh, punishment have their license for because uh, they they have the do no harm mm -hmm. uh, oath mm -hmm. and so they're supposed to but again because it is a complicit agreement between the family it's very mm -hmm. hidden chances of it then being caught is very low so it's very hard to apply the law it's very easy to say it's it's you know like there is a law of the land but to apply it mm -hmm. because it's a really a complicit agreement it's it's agreed between two parties, it's very hard mm. to be reported unless you have some sort of a police, uh, a community police in, in place. So having a law does not mean it's being applied. So, uh, and to me, even, uh, you know, even if these associations were there, they, they are very weak, you know, the, 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 the effect size of that association is so weak uh, I'm not very motivated with, with attitudes uh, mm -hmm. and law. So, uh, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Um, at least from um, population data, FGM prevalence and law, at least, uh, or attitudinal changes, if there is anything uh, to see. So, um, so what are the next steps? Um, so as, as I mentioned briefly, FGM prevalence is really the number of girls and women who have undergone FGM over time. So it's, um, it's a very, um, yeah, yeah, it's very hard to see changes over time because you really have to have cohorts dying off to see some sort of like fresh. Um, so people nowadays are working on what they, you know, they're using the data to do survival analysis to estimate the risk because your risk changes with time, depending on culture too, right? Mm -hmm. If I exited maybe the five to nine risk area, maybe the, and this is where it's most commonly performed, uh, my risk will reduce. But then some people have it after 14 years old. So, mm -hmm. so risk could be a better, well, it is a better measure of uh, FGM, uh, yeah, so if, if you would like to measure impact, probably this is the measure that you would like to use. Um, we are trying to um, compile an, uh, all the data on people involved in all of these interventions that I've described, but we also would like to look at um, this their impact at subnational level, because right now we can't quite see the effect at national level. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah, so the next step is try to understand the association at subnational level. So this is where we are at, but I just wanted to sort of like uh, yeah, just show that there's so much to learn or, or or so much to do in this area of work. And it's so much needed because now we are approaching that SDG goal. Mm -hmm. Um, and and this is where I'm just looking at you know all the students <laughs> faculty here uh, to be yeah to give me a call <laughs> to yeah so, so that we can like sort of like think together like how how best can we measure interventions their impact um, so that we really know what to put to scale because we can't really spend we have very little resources and we can't mm -hmm. spend them you know, without really knowing what is effective. So I, I'll just end at that, really. Um, and I thank you all for your time. And uh, yeah, look forward to your questions. <laughs>
Yeah, I have a question. When um, going back to your last slide, we saw where you talked about um, survival analysis. I wondered if um, there's sort of an age by which, if you haven't um, experienced FGM, you're just not going to. So, and and how different that age is um, across the focal countries. So, could you have a measure? You know, basically, could you focus on the youngest cohorts and say, you know, FB, FGM by age 20? And you're, you know, you're looking at a prevalence that's really limited towards the youngest population or the younger women, um, so that you have more of that kind of um, closeness between the interventions and then the outcome measurement, as opposed to that, you know, FGM among all women, like you yes, said. Then there's, yes. you know, you don't want to be surveying the grandmothers to know that's, what their FGM it. status is. But, but how is how different <clears throat> is that kind of maximum age of FGM? Um, across the across countries. The countries. Yeah. I, I mean, traditionally, the, what they do at surveys, they limit it up to 14 years of age. But we know um, some countries in West Africa, it's beyond the 14 years. Mm -hmm. So now it's trying to narrow down to the the 20. Probably 20 is actually a good... Uh, yeah, or 16 yeah, maybe. Or now 18, 18 yeah, consent, like yeah. around consent, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, so this is sort of the challenge. Yeah, as you said, you know, what I am measuring now is not necessarily uh, a result of the intervention that I'm doing now. It's it's probably a bit historical. And this is sort of like, the, you know, it, it's really very confusing. Like when you do a program and then the donors say, so what are the changes? What are the changes right yeah. now in the practice, right? You have to yeah. ask. Women, so it's not an exam or an objective. No, no, it's verbal. Yeah, that's so it. people might not be fully that's reported it. Yeah. as well. That's, There's it. A bias that's, it. that's also yeah. another problem, some bias is the verbal reporting. Some people are very concerned, especially when there's a law. Um, they're right. very scared to report yeah. because that's mm -hmm. they, they don't trust you know, the, you know, the interviewer. They think they'll probably report them and they'll put them to jail. So there's this, this issue about that. And um, yeah, and for girls zero to fourteen, you ask the mother, so it's not the daughter. Yeah. So there's also the honesty. I I would ask the children yeah, because the children. chances are yeah. they would. So yeah, yeah, so there is a lot of yeah. Let's see, let's try. I have a couple of questions. I don't want to forget, so I'll ask, and then we can go to the mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. questions. He Scott's finished his lunch. He wants <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so yeah, please. My questions are yeah. around. So the interventions mm -hmm. part of it. And the first is, you know, are there other, what we would call this, harmful practices that are similar to FGM that we could use and learn from? I, I'm just racking my brain and I'm not really coming up with them. It just honestly just seems so. That's one, okay, yeah, I'll write one a question. Okay. And then the, the other is, have uh, any countries tried like a harm reduction approach that would be, okay, the government is going to offer this in the facility that's like a lesser form of FG, like just the, the, a little cutting, I guess, you know, you know what I'm talking yes, about, yes, yes, like yes. not doing, like the, yes, <laughs> back yes, to yes. your dissertation. Yes, yes, <laughs> um, yes. And try to like, change the practice on the physical side, but retain mm -hmm. the cultural, religious, right. other aspects. Right. That's the second? That was it. Yes. That's, okay, good. So uh, I don't know if it's really the closest, but usually female genital mutilation is, I don't know, they, they, they think, well, child marriage is sort of like put as a, another close relative of female genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. The thing is, um, the interventions for child marriage, I don't think they are as old as the female genital mutilation interventions. So it's it's sort of like, I, I, I don't know, but I'm not an expert in that area, but the literature is still just not as strong as female genital mutilation interventions. Um, and it's really interesting. Most of the research around harmful practices have been mostly anthropological. Mm -hmm. So uh, people were trying to understand why. 
why was this why is this mm -hmm. practice done yeah. you know and so there hasn't been so much evidence around interventions and people really didn't yeah it was yeah it was mostly descriptive so the interventions have come uh, but they, even the studies around it haven't been uh, very strong so uh, child marriage is one um, i i don't know another um, that could and be yeah, scarring. I guess you could, I'm just thinking of how we could, the scarring. Would there be any infant feeding with practices that are harmful? They, they, they also they give this equivalent of um, yeah. This the, in China they used to put binding. Put binding right? Yeah, and they, they felt the community. I think the community declarations or something was a very strong intervention, mm -hmm. and that was sort of borrowed into female genital mutilation. It's really one of our major interventions. But we're, for me, we're yet to see the strong evidence to show that it really works. Um, for me, I find female genital mutilation, or, or just the female genitalia, because it's hidden. Uh, it's a taboo topic. It's very hard to address, and it's around sexuality. Very hard to, to address around religion. Um, uh, so the drivers are so hard to, to, to sort of address, right? Uh, yeah, so, you know, people have done, re you know, religious leaders' involvement and all that, but, but it's still very slow. The, the interventions haven't put, put the scale to sort of see the effect. And as you well said, um, the prevalence, the measure of prevalence isn't great. Right um, to, to to sort of like you know how could you go back in time and measure and usually interventions don't have very good programmatic data and monitoring and evaluation data to sort of like use over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, data is really a challenge uh, for us. Uh, this is one harm reduction. A very good example is Indonesia. Uh, they have it is really. Uh, when a girl is born in a hospital, part of the delivery, uh, sort of like care, is to pierce her earrings mm -hmm. and also perform uh, FGM to her by a, a health worker. Yeah. Uh, Egypt, also, they've, they've, they've involved health workers to do it, in fact, doctors. And as you've seen in the map, it's still red. So it just reinforces. Actually, I think involving health workers is the worst thing you can do it's as a harm reduction. It's much something to replace it, but not really. It's like, okay, it reinforces it. Imagine a health worker. A health worker tells yeah. you what to do, and we believe in health workers. So if you give them that, that's it endorses the practice, and people think it's really safe, and it kills. There was a case in Egypt that you know a doctor did it, and the girl died. Mm -hmm. So it's not safe. It's definitely not safe. And the mm -hmm. female genitalia, especially when it's done when a child, the baby, born, they they're like they're amputating. They're not they're not like doing anything. It's it's really bad damage. So yeah, and we've shown from the systematic review, alternative rights, um, harm reduction to work. Work. That one we know. Over. That we know. Okay. That we know. So it's really towards zero. Mm -hmm. It's this or zero. No mm -hmm. lesser forms. Yeah. So that's that. All right. Questions from the Zoom room. <laughs> yeah, with a couple of questions. We saw thanks so much. It's wonderful to hear what you're doing right now. And that was a really nice talk. Um, are you all able to hear me okay? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that I was wondering is just a follow up to what Nancy was asking, which is specifically whether the DHS data are collected in a way or could be used in a way that allow you to look at FGM prevalences across different age bands to avoid sort of the massive cohort effect that you see when you look at, at countrywide prevalences. Yes, uh, DHS data is actually in, in five year age groups, so you, you do have that. But the problem is that, um, you know, if I look at just the, the, the 
it, it's not confirmed like if a girl exits five that her risk like is zero you know she she uh, because different communities have different age groups so even if i do it at smaller age groups um it's not going to be um it it would not capture the full picture because um we also see trends that uh, FGM age, the age of performing FGM is also shifting. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's very weird. Like before we thought it was five to nine, mm -hmm. that's where most of the girls undergo FGM. But now because of law and people don't want to know that it's being done, it's, being shift, it's shifting to lower age groups. Mm -hmm. So now it's really a guess game in a, in a sense. So we need to be sure at least by, 14, <laughs> she has not undergone um, FGM, or by 18, she has not undergone uh, FGM. And even, uh, you know, I've talked to some demographers, like, why don't we do that? And, and their worry is just samples. They, everything becomes smaller and smaller. You know, when you break down the samples, like, um, you know, small, uh, age, age groups, yeah, then you can't quite look at associations. So, yeah, but that's a really good question. <laughs> I guess I would think that there would be, on some level, that at least within countries, you would be able to compare data over time in the different age bands. And the, the shift in timing of FGM would be potentially problematic, but you could potentially model that in as well. The and second... They have done this. They have done this. They we we do look at trends over time on the the zero to fourteen and also the fifteen to nineteen. We look we look at those trends, uh, but those trends are also not very rapid. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not very rapid. Yeah, but we do we do that. Great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, I have another one that's kind of measurement oriented. Yes. Um, yeah, so is um you're you're talking about attitudes, um, you know, those attitudes measures and how like you're not so satisfied with that, you know, attitudes is a predictor, right, for all the reasons you've discussed. Is there a good um linkage between like measures of intention versus versus what actually is done? I, I, I just think about, you know, this was many years ago. I lived in Mali and I think there it was often like early teenage girls. And, you know, maybe the girls would be very opposed to it, but the, it, what they weren't in control of their own bodies. And maybe even the parents would be kind of opposed, but then it's like the grandmother or some, you know, somebody else influential who can all of a sudden kind of flip it and make, make it happen, right? So um, I guess I wondered, like, are there measures of intent, intent and how closely that's correlated to whether or not it happens for us? Yeah, okay, I mean... I mean we would also like I, I remembered another paper but yes we don't measure in the dhs intention uh -huh. um, it's it's really are you supporting of fgm continuation uh, versus not do you think fgm is a religious requirement so yeah but then yeah, you intend a, to perform that's a very good uh yeah that's a very because good like, it could it be very different, different also yes. like do i agree with it in general versus am i going to do this do for this, my kid that's it because, that's it but there's also another very interesting uh, sub-analysis of DHS data. They looked at couples, um, parents, uh, discordant couples, uh, the, uh, when a mother is supporting of FGM and a father is not, for example, mm -hmm. and what, what is sort of the likelihood of a girl undergoing FGM. Mm -hmm. And they did find an association that when a mother is supportive of FGM, there is a higher likelihood of a girl undergoing FGM. Um, so it seems that mothers, to me, yeah. So the, the attitude is there and there's a higher likelihood. Yeah. So the, this one has definitely shown. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, but for me, it's now, I, I am sort of like stuck with are our are our programmatic interventions leading to attitudinal changes? And then we could yeah. make that leap of <laughs> belief that attitudinal change leads to uh, practice. Yeah. 
following yeah. this logic of it being the mother, it seems that if girls are in school, that might be a place where you could talk to them. Yes. Because they will be future potential Mother, mothers. That's, that's it. And is it part of the curriculum? I know it's really hard it sometimes is, to it get is. sexual It is. It's part recruitment. of the interventions. It is. It is put in a curricula. Um, but it's also very interesting from the DHS data, the attitudes of younger girls, 15 to 19, is comparable to their to older age, age groups. Like I would have thought like younger girls would be opposing. FGM, and it's very worrying because this is the generation to be of parents. So if they do carry the same, um, you know, beliefs, chances are. So yeah. So, but that's it. The idea is to sort of like break that vicious cycle. Try to to give them an education. Uh, it's very it's very developmental, right? So you have to get all the girls educated and educated on FGM. To do that question from yes. Robbie. Robbie, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Hello. Yeah, well, hi. Thank you for coming with us. You're welcome. Hi, David, and hi, everyone. Well, mine is like, I, I just wanted to make a comment on the, you know, 15 to 19 acting like moms, and then if mom is supportive. I feel like, um, at least for our context in Nigeria, I know that the dynamics of you know, the reality of life, okay, is um, the natural order of things, this marriage thing. So from that age of 15, you know, they're in low resource settings and in a lot of settings that continue to perpetuate FGM, there's that worry about, oh, the natural transition for a girl at puberty is for this girl to get married and move on. So if, you know, if that assumption is carried over and all this girl, you know, mothers are worried, this girl needs to get married, I need to get her a good husband, dowry will be bigger with FGM. I feel like, and, you know, girl is going to senior secondary school, maybe the schools are underfunded, you know, student, girl is not doing well in school. Her mind is, of course, going to also try to see, like, mom is telling me the truth, this is the reality, and this FGM is going to set me up. Then they would, you know, volunteer and continue to go with the FGM. So I find that that, that, that dynamic, you know, is, is very important. And, you know, it's just the perpetuation of, you know, patriarchy and so on. And even though the mothers are doing it, but all the time they'll tell you, like, I don't want my child to be a prostitute or I want, you know, my daughter. Yeah, they believe FGM curbs down, you know, sexual appetite and so on. And so daughter will not be a prostitute. So they believe that it's widespread. And then girls want to be set up to be married. So even if, you know, in the beginning, so I, I think intervention at school level should be more of like, when do we intervene? And are our schools actually in fact equipped? If I go to a private school, it's well-funded, my life is good, I feel like my mother is working and doing things, then I will, you know, stand against FGM. But if I look around and I see that in my community, all these schools are dilapidated and this school is not going to do anything for me for my future. And in fact, I am like happy as a girl that I have this as my livelihood, this marriage. People see marriage as a livelihood and social security. So then they will continue to, you know, perpetuate these cycles and they would want to continue. So I think there are two very different realities. I know in my community, FGN has, has become something that they do in babies. So you don't even know it happened to you. Also, people no longer cut, you know, teenagers. So they are cutting babies now. In fact, the way that they would come shave their hair, you know, before the seventh day, they would use that same opportunity. They will remove the uvula and they will also cut for the female. They would, yeah, oh, yeah, I have no uvula, uh, Dr. McLeland. I tell you this. I can't pronounce certain things. It's true. So I think there are two very different realities. So socioeconomic status is very important. If somebody is poor and their natural transition is this marriage is their livelihood and that is their future, then they, this FGM will not go. And if we're using legislation, then we're only just penalizing poor people. But if we are fixing schools and we are ensuring social security, not only FGM, child marriage will also go. And we saw that with COVID. The moment we, COVID happened and people were not going out there to mind their business and do their, get their money, we saw that they started to marry of children. 
not only in Africa, but also in India. So I feel like this is very important, looking at the socioeconomic factors and how they are factoring into all these problems that we have in, in societies, especially in low resource settings. And this is the same thing with when a Somali mother takes her daughter to Somalia in the summer, her daughter who is 17 or 18, to have FGM done. It's still thinking about we're in this low socioeconomic setting and my daughter, I want her to marry somebody that is in my culture and I know that FGM is having value. So we need, you know, the men to remove this value from FGM. I feel like that's the way we should think about it and think about socioeconomic status. And thank you so much, Rizal, for coming today. I apologize for coming late. I was very excited to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. I mean, okay, what I'm trying to challenge here, even in my presentation, and, and maybe I didn't put it very strongly, and I need to maybe share more data. The reasons for FGM or what's driving FGM is really diverse in many communities, right? I mean, if we look at DHS data, um, yeah, it shows us consistently that it is associated with socioeconomic status. Um, it's associated yeah. with education. But, um, you know, it's socioeconomic status and education are, I don't know, intertwined. You know, poverty and education is intertwined. And there is rural versus urban. But then in some countries, there is no difference between rural and urban uh, there's no difference between socioeconomic status, the rich and mm -hmm. the poor do it. So it's not even a poverty question or an education question, right? So mm -hmm. I, what really troubles me is, it's not, it's not troubles me, but it's so complicated that you can't really have one singular intervention or even one singular drive, yes. Yes. right? You can yes. even have in a family, a sister who decides um, yep. The same genetics, right? The same yep. household, the same exposure. Yep. But yep. she decides not to have her daughter undergo FGM and one who really believes that to have. So I, yep. I, like this, it's so complicated. And, and that's where, you know, like, what, what can we measure? What can we measure that will make sense uh, <laughs> and monitor over time and say, okay, this is changing, right? And, and for us, you know, the behavioral science, there's this, the theories of, okay, knowledge translates to attitudes, does it translates to practice. But is that really what happens? You know, you know, we, I always say at the beginning of the year, I always promise myself I'll do so many things, but do I, you know, I intend yep, that's true. <laughs> to do something, but I don't practice it. So, yep. yeah, so, so for me, you know, because it's so diverse, the drivers are so diverse. Um, I was challenged by a publisher. He tells me, I don't think interventions work. It just, it would just go by itself, <laughs> you know? And that's where I'm so keen, like, let's measure the interventions and let's see, do they work or do, do they not work? But then, you know, we are living in such a complex, uh, by the way, it's from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And there is mm -hmm. also this, that we have, and it's very common even with Sudanese, where you we have these gashes on our face. Yep, yep the facial markings. Yep. Facial, yes, the facial markings. Yep. And it, didn't, it just disappeared. It, you know, yep. we don't know what intervention happened, and maybe we need to study this some more. But it was a sign of beauty. Uh, it was a sign of identity. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just disappeared. Um, yep. So there is this sort of like even theory of like, do we really need an intervention for a social norm to go? It's just that this is quite harmful because it affects, uh, you know, if you're in the health, it does have a lot of health complications and it really stretches these low income countries some more, right? We're yeah. spending so much money. So it's, it's not because it's, uh, you know, and they do the worst, the worst forms of FGM that mm -hmm, you really mm -hmm. have to. And mm -hmm. like want to stop. So mm -hmm. and and that's why I'm really keen on on trying to you know measure the interventions, their right. effects, so, and, so that yes, so that I don't keep on repeating. And and some people believe they really strongly believe we should do this. I'm like, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence? Yes, yes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Robbie. So, thank you, so. Hi, Rizal. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, can yes, you all I hear can. me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, thank you for your presentation. So my name is Apsa. Um, I co-founded the Washington Coalition to end FGMC, which was uh, is a survival-led coalition that worked to get uh, Washington State uh, to pass a law that uh, prohibits the practice in the U.S. Um, and in April of this year, we got uh, the law passed, uh, the bill passed into law. And I just wanted to uh, speak on the issue of uh, the gap in data, um, specifically in the U.S. And I wanted to hear uh, from you whether your work looks into the U.S. at all. Uh, in doing this work, what I have come to learn was most most almost all the data, um, research data on FGM in the US has focused on African immigrants um, who come to the US and uh, children born of um, African immigrants to the US. And the problem with that data was that it had huge implications for those, both those who were counted in that data and those who were not. Um, in many ways, it left out wide individuals who have uh, who practice FGM. Um, and we know that today because many of them are coming out to share their stories. It left out uh, Asians and brown communities where this practice is also prevalent as well. And it, it contributed in many ways to uh, sort of uh, stereotype um, and marginalize communities um, immigrant communities in this country who come from societies uh, that are known to have FGM. Um, so I wanted to know, um, I, I don't think that I have come across any sort of uh, research data that has updated these um, findings that the CDC has backed in the US. And I wanted to know if uh, your work looks into this at all or not, and if there's any data. Very good. Congratulations, Absa. Uh, we don't, uh, the US is not one of our focus countries, but we do work with it through networks. Uh, there's the end FGM US network, uh, but I'm, I'll be happy to connect with you. Um, so I know of just because of my academic sort of background. Um, you're absolutely right. Most of the FGM data is driven from African immigrants. Um, and there is the, the calculation is, I feel it's very erroneous because you assume the FGM prevalence that they have in their countries of origin is equivalent to what's happening um, here. So if you want to like determine the FGM burden, you just kind of round up all the African, uh, uh, you know, decent people and assume that they would have the same FGM prevalence as their home country, which is not correct because we know uh, when people um, move, emigrate to areas where law is enforced or it's not a tradition, uh, it declines. So the likelihood of the FGM prevalences would be much lower. Um, and um, yeah, so, I don't think uh, there, I, yeah, I, I, this, I can't talk about this data, probably you'll find it published. I think the CDC is working on something uh, about the FGM uh, prevalence, and maybe you, you'll get a publication soon on this. So there is uh, data coming out from that, but yes, they're definitely, we're missing the Asian, the Indonesia. Indonesia is quite ignored. Uh, Indonesia is a big one. So it, the, yeah, that's missing. So have I answered your question? Um, yeah. So data-wise, there isn't anything new right now, but just wait, something is going to come out soon. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I also understand that FGM is also performed here in the U.S. among white populations uh, as part of a religious uh, practice of uh, trying to control I don't know, some sects, extremists. That's what I was told. The extreme uh, sex where sexuality of the girls um, needs to be brought and it's really hidden underground. Mm -hmm. So there is it, there is something going on, but so we don't know. Sex. But this is anecdotal, right? Okay. I Absa, do you know anything about that? 
some uh, extreme yeah. Christian sect, an extreme Christian sect that does that, and they that, support, th yeah, FGM. Yeah, that, there are conservative Christian communities in in the Midwest that are that are known to be engaging in this practice. But I am, and uh, some of the people who have been subjected to this practice are coming out to share their stories of this happening to them. And you can even Google it. Um, Equality Now has some of the stories. I've had the opportunity to interact with some of those women who've had gone through. Um, who've gone through the, who've been subjected to the practice. Um, but I I know that even earlier on, just from my own research in, in the 1950s in the US, um, FGM was used as sort of a cure for lesbianism. So this is not a new thing in the US uh, among white communities, but the research and data has largely ignored this and uh, made it an African issue. And I think there is a lot of intentionality around that as well in the US in terms of interventions and support for communities that are believed to be impacted by this. It's also complicated. I wouldn't speak of the US, but also in UK, where it's very much um, sort of um, enforced. Any uh, a person coming from Somalia, Sudan, you know, high prevalence, they are asked when you're going on holiday, you're going to perform that. And and it's very suspicious. It's it sort of infringes on people's rights because they force force examine. Oh, in UK. Force, yes, sometimes force examine mm -hmm. just to make sure that the girl has not undergone FGM. So so sometimes the law could also reverse, like impin you know, like infringe on your human rights, <laughs> you know, to privacy. So yeah, so it can go wrong. It can do it's what the law you also said when the laws aren't enforced. That's it, that's it. What's the point of having law? That's it, it that's important. it. But then, you know, it, it's really, it's kind of like uh, these populations are already, uh, you know, they're, I don't know, they're like a minority. So it's okay. sort of like giving them Stay even a time. harder time yeah. uh, to, to, yeah. to settle. Unless you do that for everybody. That's it, but not everybody's doing it. Yeah. Well, great, yeah. we should probably wrap up thank you. it's time, but thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank, thank you, myself. Yeah, I, I, I want to add, I want to add that in the US, so on the visa application, you have to like, you know, attest that you will not come to the US to, you know, perpetuate FGM or promote FGM or practice FGM. So it is one of the things that you have yes. to check. No, this is new. Before you this come is new. In. Yes. Yeah. And who has to do that, Ravi? So, yeah. Any person coming, you know, applying for visa, visit visa, study visa, any of those things, you have to, yep, for the U.S. visa, you have to attest that you're not coming for FGM or to promote it in any way. And just like we have the questions on human trafficking, so now they have those on FGM also. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for, for, for saying that. Yeah, yes. That actually thank you. Like yeah. Thank you, Wissel. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Okay. Yeah.